I'm going to try to do something a little bit different uh, this morning. I thought what we would do is begin a journey um, from what it used to be like in the days of open source, uh, the days of procedural programming, to today's world of interactive, iterative development, uh, multi-vendor, uh, multi-language, and to talk about some of the ideas that uh, have been generated in this day before, yesterday, uh, and hopefully today, to be able to set a tone and a direction that says that we could enter into a dialogue. What I'm going to try to do is to open up some of the conceptual questions that are f confronting you all, confronting vendors, confronting public officials all over the world, and to have a question and answer session rather than a PowerPoint kind of presentation with uh, a lot of content. I think some of the content that we saw yesterday, for example, the summary of open source and uh, standards is incredibly excellent. I think there are policy implications and directions that come out of some of those kinds of uh, content, and I would hope that in our dialogue this morning that we can begin to answer and to understand what are some of these dialogues. So if we start this journey and we look back and we say, a few years ago, open source was perceived as an anarchistic group of individuals who really wanted to change the world, and they changed the world by doing free software. Free software was not only free monetarily, but free source code. They had a profound impact on where we are and where we're going to be in the next few years. Now, I believe that we've got two people who are going to volunteer with mics. Is that right? Okay, please stand up. And so, as we go forward, my hope is that we're going to, I'm going to talk for a few minutes on about three or four slides, and then we'll open it up for questions. As we evolved into this world, there were really two different sets of world. There were those that wanted free software, a social movement, entangling uh, kinds of obligations in terms of contributions, as well as a commercial world that was dedicated to profit. And we've been talking about that um, literally for the last day. But the reality is something fundamentally different. The reality today is there is a partnership that is evolving between the spirit, the content, and the procedures of doing open source, and the monetary advantages to vendors, to governments of saving money. Right? And it is through this cultural exchange, through this governance exchange, that we're able to deal with some of the complexities that you all are facing. So for example, $60 billion US today is the number of dollars wasted with failed IT projects. Projects that get started, never completed. Projects that get deployed and are not accepted. The complexities of the problems that we're addressing today are so complex that no one vendor, no one organization or institution by itself can address them. With the budgets being decreased, with the advent of new technology constantly pushing on the limits of, of our understanding, how do we really collaborate? And so the whole world comes down to a question of how do we build communities and how do we collaborate. Now, what's happening is that this open source community has turned from an anarchistic organization of individuals, some of them programming at midnight in their underwear, to large organizations that are actively engaged in building uh, applications, tools, operating systems, in the entire stack of software. And they're interacting with commercial companies. Commercial companies who compete head on, but who also collaborate on some of the infrastructure. And that's what we're gonna talk about. Now, to get a little more specific, if you take the idea of the culture, the openness, the meritocracy, the transparency that is represented in open source, it's finding its way not only into government, but into commercial enterprise. 
So many of the paradigms that are used within the open source community are finding ways into the commercial community. So we're seeing in great big commercial companies the same basic paradigms of openness, meritocracy, transparency, and the things we've been talking about for two days finding their way into the commercial site. If you take the whole concept that we were talking about yesterday in some groups of command and control, all right, we look at commercial development, public development uh, as a command and control environment. Within the open source, there are projects that are extremely governed by a command and control environment. They have rigorous plans, rigorous test schedules. They know who's doing what, when and where on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis. They also have organically evolving organizations. Start out as incubators, move on up into very tightly rigid controlled environments. So many of the paradigms that were developed in the commercial world are finding their way into the open source world. And many of the paradigms in the open source world are finding their way back into the commercial world. If we look at the business models, business models of the free software, there are now many, many companies that are commercial, that make a lot of money, that are building software that they are providing for free for lots of different reasons. So in the Eclipse world today, for example, there's about $800 million worth of free software that has been developed by developers and businesses and individuals all over the world. On top of that platform of 800 million free code, there's about $2 billion of profitable code that's been built on top of it. So if you're looking for web browser tools, there's a place to go. If you're looking for the ability to do multi-platform on a Mac or on Linux or on Windows, that's where to go. And you can then take that technology which has been vetted and tested by millions of developers and begin to take that and apply it, change it to your particular environments. And when we look at it and we say, what is it that makes this really special? What's really special about it is the building of the community, the spirit of the collaboration, and the quality of the software. And we, when we move on into how does that happen, it happens because of a set of tools and a process of bringing open source organizations together. So when you look at open source today, you're seeing architecture councils, you're seeing planning councils, you're seeing requirements councils, you're seeing elaborate test plans, you're seeing elaborate communities of hundreds of individuals collaborating or four or five individuals who are collaborating. They're, they're common across the world as equally common with their interests and needs right down the hall. And so there are brand new ways of communicating, brand new ways to be able to understand requirements and to iterate on the requirements very carefully. We talked a lot about open standards and the point that I want to make here is that as we glo go into this world of globalization and as the standards become real true specifications, there is now an interaction that's going on between multiple standards groups that are coming together multiple organizations, open source organizations that are coming together, and they're beginning to collaborate. So today, if you take a healthcare spec uh, from one particular organization, and you follow that spec, there's no guarantee there's interoperability. But by bringing a reference implementation together with the standards teams, you can now begin to make the specifications and the reference implementations come together. At the same time, you can begin to bring in the needs of the vendors, the needs of the public sector, and begin to iterate on what their needs are from an open source perspective, from an application perspective, as well as from a standards perspective. And by then introducing early adopters, you can bring in the laggards, you can bring in the early adopters, and you can begin to say, this thing that we want to build is based upon 
a set of specifications that have been iterated on, have been validated with the early adopters, that are part of a reference implementation that is going to be supported by a set of vendors. And so it is this integration and this iteration that brings high quality, that brings people working together across the globe to solve common kinds of problems, and enables sharing of technology and methodologies and processes into the world that we all know today. So for example, if you're building a public sector application, let's say it's a, uh, a school system with a distributed payroll system, all right, and it wants to run on a Mac, it wants to run on If it wants to run on a Mac, if it wants to run on a set of Windows, if it runs, wants to run in Linux, right. building an application with common interfaces across all those multiple systems can give an environment that is going to enable you to optimize to your legacy environment. It's going to enable you to pick and choose the kind of environment that you want. The key is that it has to be designed to be integrated. Interoperability can't happen at the testing phase. Interoperability has to happen on the design phase. And coming back, that interoperability that is part of the integration phase and the design phase, if it's what the early adopters need, if it is exactly what the open source community and the commercial community are building, the odds of being successful are very, very high. So today we're seeing companies like SAP, IBM, Nokia, Motorola, in all facets of the technology cycle, in all facets of the technology chain, who normally compete are now collaborating. And why are they collaborating? Because the infrastructure is so hard. And what has happened is they've taken some of the best developers to write the hard infrastructure, and they no longer have to do that. They write it once, they can then share it, and you can take your best developers and put it in other areas. Part of what we're trying to talk about is the enablement of an ecosystem that supports the open source development, that supports the end user and the application developers. And they're symbiotically tied together. Open source would not be here today if IBM and a couple other companies hadn't invested over a billion dollars every year in order to get it kickstarted. The developers today who are doing open source are commercially paid developers. Less than 5% are independent individuals earning money, taking their money, and then applying it into the open source. So there is a fundamental different paradigm from what we used to know. At the same time, with the service centers, with the aftermarket, with the niche marketing, with companies being able to form niches, with organizations sharing code across state lines, sharing code across jurisdictions, building common code because it's been designed to be shared rather than designed to be optimized for a particular segment. Costs are being reduced, services are being improved, and developers who are in very large organizations are finding colleagues within that organization and colleagues in other organizations to be able to interact with. And the quality of the code is going up. So what I've tried to do in the last couple minutes is to take us on this journey that says we started out in a small group commercial versus open source. Right. We developed an environment for collaboration that has over 800,000 developers, 800,000 organizations, 4 million developers. And what I'd like to do is open it up for questions. And we'll spend the next 10, 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes trying to answer your questions.
So you're talking about big companies and you referred to the small companies. How, what's the attraction to the big companies and working with small companies and the benefits both ways? Uh, so so I think the question is that we've talked a lot about big companies and the real ecosystem is a combination of large companies and small companies and even individuals. And what happens is as we build out the technology, um, little niches begin to form. And these niches are symbiotic niches. So you can have a large company with a set of small companies that are building out the functionality that is not offered in the marketplace generally. A lot of the innovation, the social innovation, the economic innovation, the technical innovation is coming out of the small companies or small groups in large companies. A lot of small companies are dedicating themselves to particular functional areas and are becoming specialists in, that, in those functional areas. A lot of small companies are working very hard to be able to integrate areas that are high margin because they don't have the sales and support staff in order to optimize the, their expenses, their revenue. And so what they want to do is to form little niches that can ride together with large companies or small companies through economies of scale can do joint advertising. And this is, this is how we're seeing it happen throughout. We're also seeing it happen in non-US places. So for example, in Korea, there's a lot of public sector work being done by very small teams that are being directed at a state level. Same thing is true in China. So, What's happening is the development process, the business process, is adapting to the organizational state needs as we go forward. Is that a good answer to your question? Other questions? Please. What would you, th uh, what would be your suggestion for a small organization or individuals who have a open source project yet don't have the resources to create the infrastructure of an open source project, like the websites and things like that? What would be your suggestion on how to create or get their um, project out there? So there, there are multiple avenues or channels. You, you have the traditional SourceForge channel. You have the opportunity to network through news groups with other individuals who are interested in the same specific areas that you're interested in. By producing the technology and bringing it into the open source through an incubation process or through a SourceForge process or through an early adopter process, what happens is a community that you did not know exists starts to collaborate. By joining news groups and by joining some of the other processes that are associated with the open source, you begin to connect and communities begin to form. Because at the end of the day, the community is all about the communication, the coordination, and the commitments. And what we're seeing happening in things as diverse as the Mars rover, all right, and banking systems and public schools begin to communicate and they begin to share some of the technology. So some of the technology that today is in the command and control center for the Mars rover, that same technology is in Wall Street. That same technology is in school systems. It's in cell phones. How'd you get there? You got there because of the communication, the coordination. But more importantly, it got there because of individuals, individuals like what you're describing. So I, I please. What you say are the key characteristics of a successful uh, self-sustaining ecosystem rather than just a good idea. I'm, I'm sorry, can you... What say? would be the key characteristics of a successful ecosystem? Okay. The like key... growth, for example, is, is that a key characteristic that is growing? So, so from a... Um, what are the key characteristics of a successful project? 
I think the first has to do with the quality of the code. I think the second has to do with the market share. Are people using this code? Um, and it could be in a first instance of it, and it could be in a derived instance. It doesn't have to be that it's you know, used everywhere all at once, so we could take our time. Um, third, from a commercial perspective, it is, are people taking that code and putting it into products, providing service, branding, and support? Is it actually meeting the needs of the end user community in a multi-organizational session? What we find works really well as part of the chartering is to establish what those success criteria are at the beginning. And then we monitor it on a quarter by quarter basis. So every project gets assessed every quarter. Plans are laid out and you monitor against that plan on a quarter by quarter basis. But it's really an individual kind of thing. Um, but to operate a project without the success criteria being established uh, is, a, is a very common occurrence, extremely common. And what happens in some cases is there's this organic evolution that occurs. Things that you had never anticipated happening begin to happen. And one of the reasons they happen is because the community is so widespread. So you could begin to have a dialogue by putting something up on a news group about a particular problem that may be significant to Newport News. Somebody else somewhere in the world might have experience in solving that particular kind of problem. So I wouldn't be too critical about the organic exploration. Please. Uh, being new to open source, um, the conference has been great. We've been learning a whole lot. One of the strengths, obviously, of open source is being able to have the collaboration, sharing, getting some awesome skill sets to build an awesome product. On the flip side of that, what keeps the bad guys out? You know, I'm, I'm when sorry, you look at hackers or you know folks that can interject bad code, what keeps them out uh, of this collaboration process of being able to put bad code in? from the open source perspective? That's a really good question. Um, people new to open source have a problem. If the, people, the, the developers new to open source have a problem because it is open. It's all transparent. <coughs> it is evaluated by the peers. So the peers are the ones that sit and say, yes, this technology is going to be able to be included and not included. So that's a, that's a fearful kind of thing. What happens then is that the community begins to build and experience begins to say, yes, we can do it this way. We can learn this process. We can begin to modify that process and you begin to interact with your peers in that modification. As you then bring, go forward in your evolution, there are different stages that open source developers go through. The first stage really is where they're watching. They're looking at the news groups. They're trying to figure out where they fit. Right? There's an awful lot of work that's being done today on such issues as licensing within open source. It's not clear to me that licensing is one of the real issues that you want to focus on the beginning. What you really want to do is say, what problem are we trying to solve? How can we form a community to solve that problem? Is that a, did I answer your question? I, I still wonder how do you still keep somebody else from coming in and from looking like somebody that they're valid, but they're not really valid, who they say they are. Okay, so let, let me answer that in two ways. There is a process that individuals come forward and, and they need to be able to be judged by their peers for the merit of their work. Right. The second is, within the community, there are a lot of companies that come in right, that contribute code to the open source that competes directly with other members of the community. And sometimes these communities uh, will sit in judgment and will flame the group and say, hey, you know, this is a small company, it's trying to take the code, it's not contributing anything back, 
and that's perfectly fine. Because what we're building is a community of open communications. And we let the community police the community. So there is a company out there today that sells a product for $35 that competes with another company that sells that same, uh, well not the same, but uh, part of the same functionality, greatly enhanced, uh, of $1,200. And the community is able to adjust to that. So we encourage competition. I want to I wanna make uh, one, uh, one comment. Um, we believe fundamentally in multi-platform approaches. We believe fundamentally that Microsoft has a lot of really good technology. We believe that Linux has a lot of really good technology. And that Mac, and that QNX, and that lots of others have really good technology. So this open source is not just about Linux, or Eclipse, or Apache, or any other organization. And what I would encourage you to do is to find out those vendors, those sets of services that meet your particular needs, needs of the audience that you're trying to serve, and then adapt the technology to meet those needs. Instead of coming in and saying, I, have a, I want to do open source, and so I have to have a whole stack. You can, you can adapt and pick and choose that technology that meets your particular needs. You painted an interesting picture of the ecosystem, but I'm wondering if you can give this audience um, effective strategies to tap into the ecosystem. One of the um, common threads that I've heard during this conference and from other uh, potential open source customers has been, wow, there's a lot of open source community out there. How do I effectively get to it? Because if just throwing a problem out in a news group is not always necessarily going to be the most effective strategy um, for solving a particular problem. So I'm wondering if you could, uh, you know, suggest some effective strategies to tap into this ecosystem that you've described. Okay. Let, let, let me differentiate qui uh, real quickly between the partner programs of commercial companies and the, and the ecosystem of the uh, organizations that we've been talking about. When we look at the partner programs of big companies, Microsoft, IBM, et cetera, they look at a partner program through the eyes of what the partner can do for the company. Right? That's a different way of looking at it that says we want to build an ecosystem of partners where every partner is acting in their self-interest. And over time, by acting in their self-interest and forming niches, those niches are going to be able to grow. New members will come in, old members will leave. It's a good idea in an ecosystem to have this type of symbiotic relationship. Now, the way to communicate, all right, or, and we're not good at this, is through community tools. We use wikis extensively, but we don't have the communication tools yet to be able to take people from very diverse audiences and be able to connect them in with other people that have got similar kinds of problems. Most of our searches are horizontal rather than vertical, for example. Right? And so it's, it takes time and effort to go into this horizontal search and to find the community with the technology that is going to enable you to connect and, and to collaborate. Would you look at the, uh, or explain the Eclipse process as an example of how to tap into a community, specifically the building of projects in the and the precursor to that, uh, the incubator system that Eclipse developed? Okay. Um, if, so uh, what I'm gonna do is describe a process upon which an idea comes in to fruition and then can be acted on from a, from a community. So if you have an idea or you have a particular problem, uh, one of the ways to, to realize a solution to that problem is that you then define that problem to the greater community of Eclipse. And all you have to do is say, I've got this problem, and you can join a news group. Or you can say, I've got this 
code, I've got this problem area, I want to form a community of an incubation group, and other people who've got similar kinds of problems will come and join your group. As more people join your group, it then evolves through other stages of development within the ecosystem. So pretty soon you'll see members come to your problem solving particular project area that you had not anticipated. They will bring new members, but it's best to have it designed specifically around unique problems with tangible outcomes. Small projects start out as incubators. They then grow. They then mature. They then add processes. Some organizations, like in the Eclipse community, started out, so there's an there's a elaborate test and performance environment. It's probably got 10 to $20 million worth of code there. It's all integrated into the development environment. It started out with a little group of people in Scotland, three people. Right? Now it's got Intel, it's got IBM, it's got BEA, it's got immense value because now they're taking responsibility for bringing the needs of the big companies, the needs of the small companies, the needs of the individuals into the testing environment. And it has grown and it has now elevated into one of the main projects. Is that a, did I answer your question? Basically, uh, CLIPS has a framework to facilitate that question that you asked. How do you do it? What are the steps are? It's a shepherding framework of development to create this kind of environment. They call it the ecosystem, but it's a stepped development framework, free of charge, using open source. And it has very high IP vetting and uh, Eclipse basically does that shepherding through its project um, format. Starts out as an ecosystem. Uh, you, you, you start out with a couple of guys and some ideas. You get put into an incubator. Um, we probably have some of the world's best people at incubate, helping people incubate their projects until they become a formal project and then vetting their IP and then putting it into a common source pool so people can, can pull the code out and build enterprise solutions with very little IP risk. In other words, the property rights are well known. Um, just to share, um, it, the OSS ecosystem, you can view it from the global view or regional. For example, in Malaysia, the, uh, uh, okay, just to give a, a glimpse of what we did, uh, in the, in, the, in the early days, uh, when we just started, we, we rely on SourceForge a lot. For example, when we did the pilot projects, when we have a problem, we just, um, uh, you know, post a question at the SourceForge and we get the answer almost instantly, you know. And uh, so, so the, the ecosystem, there was a question actually about uh, not the self-sustaining, uh, what are the factors that self-sustain a project but ecosystem. So uh, an ecosystem is just like the um, natural ecosystem where you have the forest, the people, and all that. In this case, the SourceForge is the, 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 one of the most essential um, uh, communication channel that bridges all the components of the ecosystem. So that, that was uh, at the global level. But later, uh, we, we have our own version of SourceForge that is the our knowledge bank, the Malaysian Public Sector OSS Knowledge Bank. And the ecosystem at our regional level make, comprises the public sector, that is the government, which acts as the primary customer of the open source software. Uh, and the second com uh, community is the private sector that provides the uh, services that is needed commercial services with open source. Mm -hmm. And the third component of the ecosystem made, uh, is the uh, uh, universities that do research 
to support whatever needs there are in the government for this uh, OSS. So we find that these three communities, these, these three major components of the OSS ecosystem at Malaysian level work very closely and linked together by our knowledge bank. So, so, every, so in an in a economic sense, it is um, uh, uh, supply meeting the demands. The demands could be from everywhere. Supplies can be from everywhere as well mm -hmm. within the Malaysian public sector. Bridged together by the knowledge bank, like uh, at the global level, SourceForge. Mm -hmm. Just one more. Sorry. Uh, the other thing is uh, to a question about uh, uh, how how um, do we get uh, prevent you know so-called hackers actually uh, maybe undesired source code from coming in. Um, there are governance structure. Apart from uh, peer review, there are also governance structure like, uh, for example, Linux. Toval Linux started uh, the project. It is usually the, 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 the leaders of the project that uh, has a committee uh, that forms a governance structure to decide what actually can come into the mainstream codes and what cannot. So besides peer, there are also a formal governance structure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Almost throughout the world, people are experiencing the same kinds of paradigm shifts that you're describing. Um, and it's particularly true with non-English speaking areas, particularly true as people form their own source forges, or as particularly true as they then take their technology and put it into various industries or various schools, and little, little groups begin to form around that. So we appreciate your experiences. Other kinds of questions, Ben? Okay. Yeah. I hope this isn't off on a tangent too much, but I see that the uh, software as a service is maturing and offerings are broadening. And do you see that as just serving a niche? Or will that become its own ecosystem? Or will it be part of this ecosystem? Or what do you see happening in that area? Well, my guess is, the question is, is uh, software as a service. Um, and within our world, there are two parts of the question of a service. The, the first part is the question of the financial business models. Is that the question, or is it more on a service-oriented architecture? Not service-oriented architecture, but the, the, the ultimate freedom is not to own any of this stuff and just get what I want. As a, as a business okay. user. Okay, so what, what we see happening over time is that the operating systems as we see them today are really going to come up the stack and more and more functionality is going to come into the operating system or into a free uh, another layer. It might be a management layer, it may, it may be a set of services, whatever. And then what's going to happen as, as this becomes much more pronounced, there's going to be new financial models associated with how do you acquire software. Now, I believe that what's going to happen with the open source community is they're going to focus on the development, the, the design, and the building of the software. The deployment of the software the implementation of the software is going to be distributed back out to those people that are closest to where the deployment needs to be. And so I think that over time, as we stabilize what the functionality is, and we remove some of the complexities, we're going to enter into new business models that say service companies, public sector companies, or public sector organizations will be able to take this code, some of it which will be for free, and some of it which will be for, for a fee, some of it will be on a subscription basis, all right? some of it will be downloadable automatically based upon whatever your need is, and the emphasis now is going to be on the deployment side. And the emphasis is going to be on how we can take those systems that are legacy today, all right, but are running the, the, the real business as we see it today, 
and integrate that into some kind of business arrangements and services. And if we were to fantasize from a business perspective and a, and a platform perspective, that, that's how we would, that's how I would see it happening. Um, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. We're seeing, we're seeing um, free being not free, and it was discussed yesterday with how much it really costs by the time you take free code and you install it, you implement it, you service it, you support it, you change your business processes. All those are going to be fee-based services or specific services of high value from people such that work for you or part of your organizations. Someone have a question over here? The, the other thing that's interesting, I'm sorry, Ben? Skip, this has been very good. Thank you for your presentation today. Um, I want you to stretch your imagination on this question, though. Where do you see the next step, the, the new horizon, once open source has matured? Do you envision open technology manufacturing beginning to come into to, uh, to vote in terms of multiple companies or people or governments developing products, uh, consumer products, for example, that would have a mutual branding effect uh, so, that, so that the community would own it instead of individual uh, proprietary companies? Yes. So, so let me answer the question two ways. Um, and this is probably pretty controversial. When we look at Unix, all right, and we look at the install base and the years it took to get Unix, it then evolved into Linux. All right? That part of the quality and part of the, the use of Linux today is based upon that long experience of the Unix community. If you look at Visual Age as a set of products within the IBM community, they made lots of money, all right? but they didn't do the integration. You just can't take code, brand it, and make it work together. But the same people that worked eight years bringing out an IBM product set called Visual Age did Eclipse. So eight years, ten years of development went into Eclipse. So Eclipse has huge market share, but they also had eight or ten years of hard experience figuring out how to build these tools. Linux had lots of experience building Unix tools. So as we move into this new world that we're talking about, there's a cautionary note that says software's hard. Good people build good software. So where is it going to go? Our view is, is that we're going to see this layer of operating system services. We're going to see application services. We're going to see the basic infrastructure, both on the tools and the runtime. And we're now going to build a set of industry vertical application services that will require cross-industry sets of services. So if you're in Department of Health and Human Services, you're going to need a, a directory, a demographic directory. In healthcare, they call that a master patient index. In education, they call it something else. All right? But you're going to need some kind of demographic server. You're going to need security services. You're going to need interoperability services. <clears throat> you're going to need the ability to visualize input devices. You're going to need the ability to have common reports that could be generated on demand whenever you want it. Right? And so now the emphasis is going to be on those common services that are across the industries. And this will happen across the world because people who are in healthcare in Oregon have very similar problems to people in the UK or Australia. And so we see a lot of these common services being built driven by multiple needs, public and private, to come up with this layer of cross-industry services. On top of that will be a set of commercialized offerings, some for fee, some for free. Programmers today in the public sector will be able to take any of that stack and modify it, or work with your vendor to be able to modify that stack. So in health and human services, what's happening in the healthcare, they're moving to a new standard. In the UK, 
the big, they spend $44 billion in healthcare in the UK. They're having conversations with the vendors and saying, vendor, we want to continue doing business with you, but we have these needs. And we can get this code, the base code, in open source. It's free. But we want you to work with these other open source communities. We want you to work with the standards organizations to meet the needs of the consumer. And, and we see that happening in the industry verticals. Another concrete example. Um, when you look at the automobile industry, the OEMs, the manufacturers, really don't control the manufacturing of their car. It's the, their supply chain. All right? The tier ones, the tier twos, the tier threes, they each all have different tools. All of the tier ones, tier twos, and tier threes, it's in their business, best business opportunity to be able to say, use my tools because I get to gain a competitive advantage. By ha having a common set of tools, now the power has shifted back to the OEMs. And so the OEM says, I want to be able to have a complete chain of common interoperable tools, common interoperable services. And we think that's going to happen in transportation. All right. Within the transportation we see happening is that not only are the demographic services that we talked about earlier germane for Oregon as they are for North Carolina, but the kinds of fast, uh, you know, rapid response is going to have to be there. So when you have a first responder, you're going to want to plug into a particular type of machine. That technology is there today. So we encourage these groups to work together. Concrete example. The health service in the UK, the health service in Australia, and the health service in Canada are starting to work together for the first real time to drive standards and to drive reference implementations. Interoperability is going to happen in the states here in these industries as it becomes part of the culture when it becomes part of the processes that the people in Oregon in transportation or health and human services are working with their counterparts to make sure that that which that is designed that is common can be shared. That which needs to be customized can be customized. And those vendors that are providing the basic services are providing what is needed to the people who are willing to pay. One state by themselves have a hard time interacting in, with a vendor in many cases. But five states, 50 states acting together can get their attention. Is that a good answer to your question? Other questions? Let me, let me leave you with a, uh, a thought and a challenge. Um, we talked today about vendor collaboration and vendor cooperation. Um, all of you that use Windows uh, today benefit from IBM and Microsoft collaborating. They compete head on. But the world fundamentally changed from mainframes and green screens and color screens to workstations. Fundamentally altered not only computer technology but human life. The same thing happened with the embedded space, follow the same identical kind of migration path. Data integration. So we go from mainframes to workstations. With SOA, what's going to happen is we're going to spin this technology crank again, and we're going to influence lives in a far more significant way than we ever did when we did Windows. Because now what's going to happen is the user is going to be in charge. The user is going to be able to pick and choose what components, what functions they want to use, and they're going to be able to have access to information where they want it, when they want it, how they want it. 
Now, is that going to be here today? No. Will it come? Absolutely. How is it going to look? I'm not sure. But I will bet that if we bring multi-vendors together, and we bring multi-standards together, and we bring multi-companies together, and we build reference implementations with early adopters, many of whom could be you guys, that we will fundamentally alter the human experience again of how we interact with information. So, for example, in healthcare, the patient will be able to access their records when they want them, how they want them, where they want them. The embedded technology can work with the transportation to bring the services of things like GPSs to the reality of highways. So it's going to be an incredibly different world as we go forward and we shift the locus of power to individuals. And we then supply secure, trusted environments and sets of services that will enable that to happen. And my guess is, my guess is, it's going to roll out in the public sector. And part of the reason I believe that is the service need in the public sector is so high. The budgets are becoming so constrained. But the goal is not measured in profitability. The goal is measured in human services. The goal is measured in the needs being met, the roads being built, the transportation systems, the highway systems, the dams, the water. All right? That's what's going to fundamentally alter what the human experience is going to be. And I think it's going to roll out in the public sector. Because the goals of the public sector are significantly different. The measurements are significantly different. And they're more service-oriented human-oriented than they are financially-oriented. Maybe controversial, don't know. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to chat with you all. Uh, I hope the, uh, the format wasn't uh, too controversial, or, and I hope it met your needs. I, I think we have one more question. Years ago, I helped design one of the first uh, transportation systems used by the, the Department of Highway Vehicles. Uh, and then a policeman would go to the system and look up my driver's license number and be able to tell, you know, um, what I had done in the past. Um, so I knew that system was there. We worked on it. And uh, much to my chagrin, I was going down the highway one day in the Raleigh-Durham airport area, and I knew that the Raleigh-Durham airport area wasn't under the jurisdiction of the highway patrol. I knew that the systems weren't interrelated, so, and I was running late, so I hit the speed as soon as I hit that jurisdiction. Well, I was pulled over. They had changed the jurisdiction uh, without, <laughs> without telling the computer programmers that they had changed it. Uh, so I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I don't know how it's going to roll out, but I, please go ahead. I think we could link the two conversations we we're having together, right? We do not know today how to really, truly collaborate when we're not writing code with people who have similar interests, similar streams of consciousness. All right? My challenge, and I'd be more than glad to help work on it, is that GOSCON next year would come back 
and could we could begin to address that kind of experience. Very candidly, taking a system out of one state and putting it into the system of another state isn't going to get you the interoperability or the success that you, that you really need. But if you can begin to build these networks of people who, that have funds, that have ideas, have responsibilities, and hopes, my guess is, and we can use collaboration tooling, my guess is, is that we could next year be piloting and showing some of these non-code writing experiences, because it's all about community, it's all about collaboration. I think I'm running late, and I apologize, but thank you all very much. I enjoyed it.